Hey there, welcome to day 27. In this one, we are gonna be doing asynchronous web scraping. Now day 12, we did synchronous web scraping, which is fundamentally easier than asynchronous web scraping, but quite a bit slower. So asynchronous web scraping allows us to take advantage of Python 3's built-in asynchronous capabilities with async.io. So this whole series, what we've been doing is writing synchronous code. That is blocking code that essentially says, hey, if you got a function, finish running that function and then go to the next one and then so on. You know, something like this where we've got function AAA and then function ZZZ and all of these functions in between, right? So if we call AAA, that one's called first, all the way down to any other functions we have in between ZZZ, right? They're not running at the same time or actually overlapping at all. So think of this in web scraping, right? So if you want to actually web scrape 10 pages, what synchronous code would do is page one, page two, page three, and so on until the entire thing's done, which let's say each page takes a second. That takes about 10 seconds to actually complete. But if you actually wanted to do asynchronous coding of that, you can actually run all of these things concurrently, where it's kind of like switching back and forth between each page. So page one through 10 are all running at roughly the same speed or the entire program is going to take roughly how long the slowest page takes, which we'll see in just a moment. Uh, but the general idea is that each function in synchronous code blocks the next one from running and asynchronous code, it doesn't do it that way. So let's actually take a look at a synchronous example, like a, a functional example. Uh, this of course is on our GitHub and I do recommend that you actually download this synchronous code. Of course you could pause and run this as well. Um, but the general idea is this, we have a list of iteration times. We have a function that will actually sleep for any given time that's passed to it or seconds that's passed to it. And then we have our main function here that's essentially simulating like each page being scraped or opened up. Uh, and then we get this full runtime here. Okay, so it's actually pretty simple of a function itself. And of course, this is a synchronous blocking function. So much like the blocking.py, we had these two functions running here. This iteration right here is doing that same thing. So this sleeper function is gonna wait however many seconds we put in there, right? So we iterate through all those seconds and it's gonna wait for that time. So the whole thing's gonna run roughly 10 seconds long, which I know this because that's what the iteration times are. Uh, but if we actually run this and it's gonna be python sync.py, we can see those iterations happening. We can see how it's blocking the code, right? We see all of that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So how do we actually turn this into synchronous code, right? How do we speed up this 10 seconds of running time? Well, it's actually really easy. So copying all this code into async.py, it's literally the same code, except I got rid of this main function running. Um, to change it to asynchronous code, we just write async on and in front of every function. There you go, you now have asynchronous code. How cool is that? Well, not quite, right? So what I actually wanna do is ignore the iteration for now. So we'll comment that out. And I'm just gonna call sleeper one time and I'll just give it, you know, one second and an iteration of zero. I'm also gonna get rid of that async in front of that sleeper function. And we're just gonna really focus on running one asynchronous function for now. Okay, so we've got this. Uh, what I wanna do is now run Python in interactive mode with python-i and async.py. So what I can do is call main to run it, or can I? What I get back is something called a coroutine object. So it's no longer a function, it is now an object, right? So that means that we still need something else to actually run this main object. Okay, so how do we execute a coroutine is the question. Well, there's a few ways to do it. But if it's our primary function, if it's our main function that's gonna run all of our other functions or coroutines, then what we wanna use is async IO. So we import async IO. This is built in to Python. And of course we can bring this into this async function as well. And then we run async IO dot run of a coroutine. So if I just did main, that's not a coroutine. That's just describing the function itself. 
As we see here, we got a coroutine was expected, but it got a function. So we need to initialize our coroutine by calling that function. And we run this, and now it actually runs. It actually ran a synchronous or an asynchronous function and a synchronous function, right? So it ran both of those things side by side with really no issues, okay? So that's pretty easy to do then, right? We first off declare a coroutine, and then we have to run that coroutine with asyncio.run. Now, there are other ways to run this, um, so just keep that in mind, but for our purposes, asyncio.run is gonna be perfect, and it will be perfect for a vast majority of tasks that you're gonna be challenged with. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and actually turn this sleeper function into async again. So I'll go ahead and async that function. I'll exit out of here now. And since I have the run async run in here going, I'm going to go ahead and run this again outside of the interactive mode. And what we get is runtime warning coroutine sleeper was never awaited. So what this is showing us is a, another issue and another challenge that you'll come across when you're calling or using coroutines. Remember how we actually had to use asyncio.run to run that main coroutine? Well, to actually run coroutines within other coroutines or other asynchronous functions, we actually call await in there. What that's gonna do is call this function and wait for it to complete prior to doing whatever's next. So this is actually gonna block what's coming after this in this main function. So let's go ahead and run this. And now it actually ran it. So we're actually ready to start trying out that loop. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that. And I'm gonna get rid of this await call here and instead I'll just put it here. Okay, so this runtime and just like many other functions, this sleeper actually returns a value. So in order to update our global runtime variable, we have to call await in front of that sleeper function still. So another thing to think about with that is basically the result of that is equal to that await call, and then we just add it. So again, this is how we call it. Much like when you're calling a regular function, you know that that's gonna await for it to finish. But again, this is now a coroutine because of that async stuff. So we just need to use the command called await. And of course, it's always going to tell us that, right? It will give us runtime warnings when that you don't do those things. So we save this and now we're going to go ahead and run it. So we're going to run through each iteration, much like we saw before. But unfortunately, what we're seeing here is zero performance increases. There's, there's literally none, right? We should have printed out the runtime. Um, but as we saw, it didn't actually seem to change how fast everything was running. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this, but the primary reason is this time.sleep right here. This is not a coroutine, and therefore it's running as it was before. And also how this method is working, it's also not running great. Um, so let's go ahead and change time.sleep into a coroutine itself. Because again, what we want is to have coroutines calling coroutines if it's necessary or if it has to happen. So in the case of async.io, we want to use async.io.sleep. And again, that's a coroutine, so we can await it. Let's go ahead and run this again. And press up, there we go. Um, and so, same thing, okay? So this is where hopefully it starts to feel like What's the benefit of writing asynchronous code? Well, it ran for 10 seconds. The benefit is this. We can actually change how these results work altogether by saying, let's give me a task list. So I'll call this tasks and it's empty. So each one of these coroutines can be considered a task that async IO needs to run. Um, so basically what I'm saying here is I wanna iterate through all of these iteration times I want to initialize the coroutines, turn it into like a queue or a list of tasks that async.io should run. It doesn't matter how or when they're run, they just need to be run. Um, and then I'm gonna return what that actual data is. So what that means is this right here is all I need here. I'm gonna get rid of these. And I'm gonna call async.io.createTask. 
and I'm going to add in the coroutine there. All right, so this is going to create that task, and we can actually append it to task.append. Okay, so now we have a bunch of tasks that we want async.io to run. So the final step then is to run something called async.io.gather on all of those tasks. So we actually unpack them with the star uh, and it's gonna run it on all of those. And this is also needing to be awaited. And this will also give us a result. I'll explain why in a second. So let's say result equals to that. And we're gonna go ahead and print out what that result is. Um, but the general idea is the vast majority of times when you call an asynchronous function, you absolutely need to call await. The only difference is this async.io create task is not being awaited because essentially you're making a queue or a list of asynchronous tasks that should be run. And then async.io.gather actually executes and runs those tasks. So let's go ahead and see this. I'm gonna run this. Notice the print statements came out immediately, right? And then all of the results from those things came out shortly after. So these are the actual results from each one of these functions. And the only reason I actually have data from there is because this coroutine, this function, this asynchronous function is actually returning something. So if it wasn't returning anything, um, this results thing would be empty. It would actually have nothing. Um, but since it is returning something and it's a list of things, it returns a list of those results. And they are different for each iteration, okay? So what that means then is I can actually update my runtime based off of those results. So for uh, run time result in result, this should probably be just results because it's plural. Um, then I can actually do that runtime plus equals to that runtime result. Okay, so we save that and let's run it again. And what we should see is huge performance increase, but we don't. We see 10 seconds still. So the entire thing ran for 10 seconds, but it seems like, well, why would it run for 10 seconds? It didn't actually feel like it was 10 seconds. Well, actually it was this problem right here. So what we actually wanna have is the runtime result being equal to you know whatever the top result is we can actually count this aloud and we'll do that in a moment so basically if the runtime result is greater than the current runtime then we'll actually set that runtime result okay so let's go ahead and run it one two three four five i probably counted way too fast because that's what i do um but there you go you actually get four seconds and you can try this out on your own um, for the actual results. What I got though, what I originally showed you was the actual program runtime or total runtime. Like actual, actually let's call this the total compute runtime. Like what it would have been if it was synchronous would actually be related to this. So we'll go ahead and say global. And this is where we'd actually want to put in our runtime result. And now we can say it ran for that with a total of that total runtime. And let's say runtime divided by the total compute runtime. Uh, and we'll go ahead and run that again. And so again, each one of these things is gonna still take that same amount of compute, right? So it still takes the same amount of compute, but it's 40%, it's at the 40% of the same time period it happens. Um, so this is the magic of asynchronous code and also the challenge of asynchronous code. Like actually remembering all of this stuff does get a bit tricky, but that's where it comes to practicing with a real world example. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so you might remember back to day 12 when we did synchronous scraping and we used the package called requests. Unfortunately, we actually can't use the package for requests to do actual asynchronous scraping, at least not yet. Maybe in the future, but for now, what we need to use is something called 
AIO HTTP. This actually provides us two features that are really cool. One of them is to actually do the requests to other URLs asynchronously. Another is actually to run asynchronous code so we can actually create our own asynchronous web application using AIO HTTP as well. But of course, we just wanna use it to actually grab a URL. So let's actually see how we do that. First and foremost, we need to install it with pip BMV install AIO HTTP. Uh, you can also do pip install AIO HTTP. It's completely up to you. Uh, but after you run that installation, you have AIO HTTP import client session. So what we wanna do is initialize a client session and do some requests. So what I'm gonna do is define our main function. So async def main and we're gonna use this client session. Uh, so to do this, there's a couple different ways on how we can go about doing it. I'm just gonna do a very basic one first, and I'm also gonna set a URL. So the URL I'm gonna use is from Box Office Mojo. So very similar to what we did before. So boxofficemojo.com, um, and then we're gonna go into yearly, yearly uh, box office reports which of course 2020 does not have great years. Uh, so let's go ahead and go into 2019's URL first. So this is the very first one I'll use. I don't need that reference there. All I need is to 2019, okay? So what I wanna do is use client session to read the HTML body content from here. Now do keep in mind that this will not work on JavaScript heavy websites. In other words, if you see a loading icon here when the page loads um, as in the you know the rest of the page is there but then there's this loading going on we won't be able to do those pages uh, just yet I'll, I'll tell you how to do it later um, or a resource for learning how to do it but for now we're going to go ahead and use a synchronous loading or not a javascript heavy website um, okay so we've got this url and now we're going to go ahead and do async with client session as session so you might be familiar with the with command um, so basically what's going to happen is you're going to run some code in here and once it's done it's going to cease that client session it's going to just end it um, so to actually do the request here then we do another thing with async with and now it's using that session and we're going to go ahead and get now of course you could use post you could use other kinds of http methods here uh, but we're going to go ahead and get that URL and then we're going to grab the response and set it as response. Okay, so here's the initial session and then the actual response. Now, the reason we absolutely want to use a session as well is because we're going to have multiple requests. We're not going to just do one. Uh, so it's nice to have a session open that we can run the session.get many, many times. So then the final thing is just the HTML body is going to be equal to await response.read. Okay, so this is going to be our HTML body text. So I could leave it in here as an empty string and then set it down here. And then finally, we'll go ahead and return that HTML body. Okay, so let's go ahead and, or well, let's return this inside of the response itself. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. First off, I'll go ahead and import async IO. So import async IO. And then just we'll go ahead and print out async IO.run that main coroutine. Okay, so save it and we'll go ahead and run Python a scrape.py, which of course is the name of my module here. And we'll give that a shot. Okay. So it is gonna be pretty fast and we get a bunch of body data in here, right? So that's actually our HTML data, uh, which is pretty nice. Cool. Um, so before we go any further, what I wanna do is actually store that HTML data. And I'm gonna do it using pathlib. So import pathlib. And really what I'm gonna do is say HTML data equals to, and again, I'm just gonna leave it in as the response from that. And then I'll go ahead and do my output dir is pathlib.path and dot resolve. So this will give me my current directory. And then we go ahead and say outputs 
or let's go ahead and call this snap shots and with that i can now do output file and it's our output dir and in this case i'll just call it 2019.html because it's the name of that year and then i'll go ahead and write that content so output file write text and html data now i actually know that i need to decode this from bytes so i just call decode i'll show you that in a moment and if you're not familiar with this method of doing things, it's identical or very close to with open and then the path, you know, the path that you want to go to output and then, you know, write as F and then F dot write and then that same, same data here. Now I don't actually have the snapshots folder created. So there's one more thing that path lib makes it really easy to do is just output dir and make dir oops not make child but make dir and parent equals the true and exists okay equals the true or rather i got the s is incorrect so it should be parents equals the true and exist okay is also equal to true so now i'm going to go ahead and run this again this time it won't print anything out uh, but what we should see is a folder being created snapshots and then 2019 Dot HTML. Now, a big part of the reason to me to actually store the raw HTML that you request, um, it's a couple of reasons. One is since asynchronous code is going to happen a lot faster, then I can always come back to this later. But actually, it's the main thing is coming back to it later. I'm actually getting quite literally a snapshot in time of what that HTML is. So I don't necessarily always have to go and do it. Uh, which just helps me down the line. It's not really that relevant for what we're doing here, but we might as well do some a little bit better practices in real time. Okay, um, so that's just one URL, right? Now we actually need to use multiple and create multiple requests. Now it might be as simple as you think where we actually did the async IO tasks and that gather call. Um, inside of something like this. But what I wanna do is actually break this apart a little bit. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so picking up where we left off, I'm gonna actually use this in a module called a scrape multi, um, just as a way to make it easier to reference what we just talked about. So now what I wanna do is actually break this apart a little bit more. So what I'm gonna do here is do async death and we'll go, go ahead and call this fetch, which is going to be our URL and our session. Um, and so all that's going to be is this right here. Okay. So the reason for this or to have a different method for grabbing the data absolutely has to do with the iterations that we want to have. So let's go ahead and say years ago being, I don't know, five, and then our start year being 2020. Okay, um, of course you could use daytime objects, you can use all sorts of things to make this a little bit more robust. But the idea is now what I wanna do is actually iterate through this. So what I'm gonna do is say for i in range, and this is gonna be zero to years ago. Then I'll go ahead and say my year is equal to my start year minus i, whatever that is, right? So. Uh, it's going to go from zero to five so by the end it will have five years ago hopefully okay and the first one will be the zeroth element so it should be 2020 and we can print out what that is print year and year okay so much like what we saw before we actually have our tasks or the tasks that we want async io to have and so we're going to go ahead and do tasks dot append give us some space here task on append and again we do async io dot create task so this is going to be the coroutine that we want to use which is our fetch call here for the url we're going to be using so the url itself I should probably set that as a string substitution url now instead of what we had before so let's go ahead and say f here and do this URL. 
Now, I already did the logic behind this, so if you're confused about the logic behind this, by all means, go ahead and go back to day 12. Um, but essentially, I already know that from the URL, we can actually go and go back to different years and whatnot. So we've got year and then our URL. Okay, so we've got our URL here. And then the next item was our session. And this should return our HTML body content. So that means that our gather call will have a list of lists. So this right here, this is gonna now be our HTML body content, um, or rather all of our pages content is going to be equal to await async.io dot gather all of those tasks. So we wanna unpack them just like that. And we're gonna go ahead and return that page's content. Now, every once in a while, what you might see is something more like this, where a wait is called after that. That's okay. Uh, you just need to make sure that however you do it, you are awaiting whatever that coroutine is. Okay, so now we have a number of pages that we can actually go and scrape. Uh, this time our output file or our snapshot is going to be, well, it's going to be a little different. So let's actually print out what that data is going to be. So what we should see is actually a list of body data. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this. And this is a scrape, a scrape multi. Okay, so it shows me all the different years. So 16, 17, and so on. And it, it, it basically happens like that. Okay, so this HTML data here is actually what, what we want to see, right? And VS Code froze. Okay, so VS Code froze. Um, so I'm just back at it. Um, I think it froze because we just had a lot of content that was being loaded into memory. Um, so what I actually wanna do is take this a bit further and change the results themselves, right? So what I wanna have inside of my task, in this case, I'm gonna also add in my year that's coming in here because of the outputs that I wanna have. So I'm gonna bring in my year into fetch. So as it was, it's actually better for, you know, more places or more things. And now what I can do is actually return back a dictionary of this stuff. So body is that body and then our year is year okay so now my results should be a list of items that have a body you know with some data and then a year with some other data and it's probably going to be a number like 2020. Uh, so real simple change, but what that's going to mean then is my results, which is this is actually going to be a little bit easier to store, uh, much like what we had here. So now I can actually give that same output directory and then iterate through for results in result and just run this same thing but just grabbing the key value pairs now. So current year equals to, or I got these things backwards. Current year is results, get and year. And put an F string here, there we go. And then our HTML data is gonna be result.get and this was body okay so that should now give us uh, our better results i'm not going to print it out this time instead i'm just going to have it go straight into uh, the html content that they have so let's go ahead and save it and let's run this again with python a scrape multi dot pi and it's still going to all those years and inside of my snapshots what do you know that was so fast like to do that synchronously it'd be one by one it'd still probably be pretty fast because box office mojo 
has quite um, the server on it because they get a lot of traffic. Um, but as we see, we now have done asynchronous web scraping. Uh, but there is still one part that is missing, and that is just the sheer amount of speed that AsyncIO allows for and AIO HTTP. So we actually need to add something else in here called a semaphore, which means that we're not gonna just overload their server. Could you imagine if we did 100 of their pages or 2000? The semaphore is actually going to prevent just crushing their server, which is absolutely something we don't wanna do for several reasons. One, when you are web scraping, you should be a good internet citizen. And then two, um, you might actually get your IP banned from actually even opening their web page normally. So keep that in mind. But let's go ahead and implement this semaphore right now. Now we're gonna go ahead and implement a semaphore. And before I discuss what it is, let's talk about what a potential problem might happen with our current lookup. Now in this for loop here, we have an arbitrary amount of range. So that means that I could essentially have a million or more tasks that AsyncIO is going to create. Now, let's assume that your computer can handle that number of tasks. That also means that concurrently, we are gonna be hammering this server of those million tasks. I mean, sure, it's gonna be going back and forth. So concurrently, we'd be switching those requests each time, um, which means that, you know, boxofficemojo.com wouldn't actually get a million requests at once. It would more be staggered, only slightly staggered, but still staggered. Um, so we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna do that to our computer. We don't wanna do it to their computer. So what we need is something in the middle that's gonna prevent certain tasks from running in a logical way and not having to write our own sort of logic, right? So I don't need to write all these conditional statements like, hey, is a task running right now? Uh, let's not run until that one's done. I don't need to do all that. Instead, what I can do is use a semaphore. Another analogy for this is like at an amusement park, right? So if at an amusement park and you're trying to get on a roller coaster, if everyone got on that roller coaster, it just wouldn't work. It would either break or everyone would fall out of it, right? So uh, what they do is they have a ride attendant, of course, and they, that ride attendant prevents a certain amount of people from going on that roller coaster. There's a small amount that can go on, everybody else has to wait. A semaphore essentially does that same thing. So what we wanna do is actually bring in a semaphore and use it inside of AsyncIO. It's really simple, we just do sem equals to AsyncIO dot semaphore, and then we give it some sort of limit. So the limit is roughly how many requests or how many tasks we're actually gonna run at any given time. Okay, so you can say 100, you can say two, it's really up to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it in as 10. So this is gonna be doing those 10 tasks at any given time. So it gives me somewhat of an interval between each semaphore or each actual fetch itself, this right here. Um, so that means that I need to add in one more feature to doing this. So I'm actually gonna copy this original fetch and I'm gonna call this fetch with sim and i'm just going to take in one more argument here and that is my semaphore itself and so what i'm just going to do is say async with sim and now i'm going to return back await fetch url session year okay so naturally i could put these two together but it actually makes a lot more sense to have them separate because every once in a while you might not need that semaphore and it's a good idea to have your URL being able to work in here. In fact, we might as well just say year equals to none as well in case somebody doesn't actually pass a year in there uh, because that's a fairly arbitrary thing that's related only to what we're doing here. Where fetch with semaphore and fetch, those two things are definitely gonna be reused in the future for other kinds of asynchronous scraping. So now that we've got that, we can actually scroll down here and use that as our create task instead. And then we can go ahead and run this. So Python and a scrape sima.py. Um, and so, oops, we missed a required argument here and that's, we need to add in sima or sim. In fact, I'm actually gonna change it a little bit and do sim URL or sim session and then URL and year. 
I'm only changing this because the first three are required. The last one is not in this case. Um, of course, I can leave fetch as it was, but I do want to have it like this. And then we'll pass in year equals to year. And that should be session, not session. Okay, let's try it again, run it. And capital Y, lowercase y. One more time, and there we go. Okay, so to actually measure these results and see that it is actually working, um, you could just use the timing that we did before with the synchronous, right? So you can actually add in your start and end times and or rather start and end times in any given coroutine or function or asynchronous function to see exactly how long these things are taking. You could also run it um, outside of the main because what you won't see most likely is exactly how the effect of this semaphore on your application with something this small. You would see it a lot bigger. And especially if you had the backend access as well, you would then see the load that is actually coming through on your server side. But of course we don't have that access. So there's no real way to show this other than, yeah, this is kind of like a ride attendant preventing too many web scraping events from happening all at once. And really 10 or even 20, that's probably plenty for the vast majority of web scraping. Like I could actually get up to now like 20 years. I, I'm not sure if the actual uh, website even has more than 20 years, but let's go ahead and try 20 years now. And we can see roughly how fast it goes. I mean, it's, it's not gonna take that long. It might maybe like 10 seconds, right? And now I have all of those pages. Um, so, okay, that's it for semaphores. Let me know if this isn't exactly clear. Um, I know it wasn't for me at first. I had to really practice a lot of using it prior to really getting the full benefit. But initially I didn't even have them. And then I was like really just hammering these other servers and it's just, just not a good idea. We really wanna use those semaphores. Hey there, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you got something out of this one. Now doing asynchronous programming is a little challenging because this idea of switching back and forth between functions just really isn't that straightforward. I think the logical, the synchronous programming is a lot more palpable of building applications. Because the other thing, something we really didn't go into is debugging asynchronous code is also way more challenging than just debugging synchronous code. But if you are ready to go even deeper into this idea of asynchronous scraping and more specifically web scraping on JavaScript enabled sites, then I highly recommend you do our project supercharged web scraping with async.io. It will reiterate some of the things that we talked about here, but something that we didn't cover is JavaScript heavy websites. JavaScript heavy websites typically use something like Selenium to actually load up the page and do all the actions you need to do on there. What we need to do is something different than Selenium using async.io. There are some other packages that allow Selenium to work, but it's better to actually use an asynchronous version. And so that project will actually absolutely go through all of that for you and help reiterate everything that we learned here. So thanks again for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.